Hello, welcome back to Stackhouse Live down here in Wellington, New Zealand. Thank you very much for watching. Today I'm going to be talking about power hammers and in detail, my power hammer. My power hammer is a boss hammer. If you do a bit of research and a bit of uh, googling on that particular type of hammer, it's a American branded hammer and it was made by a company called Novelty Ironworks and they were situated in Iowa in America. So, if you're not familiar about what a power hammer is, or you're um, unsure about what they do, they are pretty much a machine designed to beat out hot steel. Now there is a time where your body won't work on doing a larger section of steel, so you're going to have to employ a machine to do the work for you. This is where a power hammer comes in place, and is designed to work the larger sections of steel, so that your body doesn't have to exert itself as much. People had to invent new machines and new options such as presses, power hammers, uh, fly presses, screw presses, all sorts of bigger machines to accommodate for this type of large based work. So in this day and age we use them for uh, blacksmithing and knife making and personally I use mine for a lot of Damascus steel making if you see that in my other videos. Everything on this machine, this power hammer in particular, you can just get to without having to remove large components to access moving parts. All of the moving parts are easy to grease, to fix, to unbolt, to rebolt, to tighten, all of those things. Uh, what I really like about my power hammer the most is that the previous owner had modified this design. The clutch system up here, that, which is, it's, it's a clutch, it's pretty much a clutch. The idea is that it pushes onto the uh, drum uh, while it's spinning and it makes the entire mechanism at the front here actuate. One that works, it basically hammers the steel. It's pretty simple. I think the dates were 1860, that was when this guy was patented or built, or designed, whatever. And they went out of action in 1908, I believe. Now that's when the company just went bust and they sold all the equipment and that was the end of their, their era. And I'm unsure whether he made these current modifications to run it on electricity because the machine was powered by steam to uh, start with. This drum at the top here would have been connected to a line shaft and the line shaft would have been basically a long metal shaft at the top of a building and at one end it would have a big bearing holding it in place and at the other end would be a steam engine. So this guy actually predates electricity. The idea is that the line shaft would be operating and constantly spinning with different flat belts and different machinery, uh, different machines attached to it. Now, they are all spinning and in a way idling. And when you actuate one of the machines, then that transfers the energy from the flat belt, or from, sorry, from the line shaft to the flat belt of whatever machine you're using. This could be on uh, old fashioned drill presses could be on presses, could be on uh, power stamps, it could be on all sorts of machines that were made in that era. Mine in particular would have just had this flat belt idling forever and when I wanted to use the power hammer I put my foot on the treadle and it would operate. Later owners have made a electrical modification for this guy to run on a six horsepower motor. As you can see this guy down here, this is the six horsepower motor. So how does it work? It works by this uh, motor essentially turning a pulley which is connected to a V-belt which connects to the center column that has a, another shaft with bearing housings and other pulleys. So this centerpiece here is designed to gear down the current speed of the motor to make the top drum up here spin at a slower speed. So if I should probably draw a diagram. I'm going to draw a diagram. Okie dokie. So we've got three different types of pulleys. We have one at the base here. That's connected to the motor. You can see there, dot, 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 dot. This is the motor here. That then connects to a larger pulley, which runs on a center shaft that connects a smaller pulley, spinning at a similar diameter, uh, sorry, a similar RPM which will result in this small pulley connecting to this top drum. 
like so. So we've got one pulley like that, and then the other two pulleys like that. It's actually quite simple. It's just really hard to see on this particular angle. The machine took me about three months to almost completely dismantle and rebuild from the top up. Getting this part was quite a hard endeavor. This was completely seized of grease, thankfully. It was grease, not rust. And it was very hard to get this. Now I bought my machine for 3,000 New Zealand dollars, which is I think around about maybe 2,100 US. I'm not sure what the calculator, what the uh, exchange rates are at the moment. Rather cheap, that's what we ended up buying it for. Now when I did buy this machine, I was, uh, I'm still young, uh, younger, and the, I didn't really see what the issues were. All I saw was like this power hammer, that would be amazing. And it really is amazing, it really is. But the uh, attitude that I was hoping that it would just work when I bought it, and obviously it's an old machine, it's 150 years old, just about, I ended up using uh, a lot more tools and equipment that I wasn't really uh, acquainted to, to learn how this guy worked. Now, this part of the flywheel here allows me to adjust the throw distance of the hammer, which means how much it wants to chuck down the ram, which is this dude here. If the center shaft is uh, all the way out, that'll be the hardest it can hit, and also the slowest it can hit. I currently have it on a faster setting where it's pushed almost to the center of the flywheel. This means that it can actuate a lot quicker, and I get a few more rotations every pull. If the piece is further out, it will operate a little bit more slower, and it will hit a lot harder. Now the second part about this hammer um, that is almost a, I think a restriction and not nearly as wonderful as all those pneumatic hammers, but pneumatic hammers were probably built around 70 years after this guy, so I can deal with that. Next part is the throat height of the power hammer. This particular section is actually threaded both ways from the top of this bearing up here and the spring. So I can adjust the thread by threading it and this will help lower down my ram. Why do I want the ram to be lower? Maybe I've got shorter, smaller stock that I want to have squished. And I need it to hit a certain height and go back up a certain height. This is where this is really, really versatile between working at this particular height and this particular distance out from the flywheel. I can create some really effective uh, forgings from this type of hammer. So I can adjust it at the ready while the forge is operating. That's what's really wonderful about this particular hammer. Now, it is a limitation because if you have a pneumatic hammer, which are a much more modern and efficient design, they have a piston that is inside a housing. And the piston is uh, air driven and is actuated through diff two different types of valves, which push and pull the air depending on how much air is pushed through and back up through the uh, housing, which in turn moves the ram and the piston of the Hammer. These will allow you to have a much higher throat depth, meaning you can put some much larger toolings into the uh, underneath the power hammer dies, and you can utilize the the height just a different way. Those particular hammers hit and strike quite differently compared to these guys as well. This guy needs to make a full rotation to be working effectively, almost consistently. So it needs to be hitting, striking, hitting, striking. As soon as it slows down, it loses that velocity and also loses that impact. So once you lose the impact and velocity qualities, it's really just a large piece of steel pushing onto the material, and it's not really forging it so much. This is where the spring comes into play. The spring, the ram, and the uh, toggle arms, or the sway arms, I like to call them sway arms, create a flexible nature to the ram. This means that as the uh, ram is going up and down very fast by the move by the flywheel and shaft and the wall of the motor, the idea is that it has some flexibility in motion. So it has this sprung impact feel to, to it. And they just feel different to a pneumatic hammer. And the reason for this is because the sway arms are basically like this when they're fixed and they're not moving. And when you start to use the hammer, the arms will start to bend like this. And the ram is in the middle, and it starts to bend and throw the 
RAM onto the workpiece. Once it throws the, the RAM onto the workpiece, you've got this additional inertia, this additional effect that helps drive that RAM into the workpiece. This is why I really like this particular hammer for Damascus steel. If I put a piece of stock through, it really knocks it out much, much more quickly. And the throw effect that it has is very, very controllable. These uh, dies on the power hammer aren't perfect. And this is probably the least like section of my power hammer. And yes, it's the most important part of your power hammer because the dies will result in how well your forgings will be. Uh, this power hammer has a lot of really sweet spots for working the steel and you have to find those sweet spots. When you know where they are, they work really well. But when I first bought the power hammer, the uh, dovetail dies were incredibly uneven, very, very uneven. So I had to do a lot of hand grinding. I, did, I was limited to equipment in those days as well. I had to do a lot of hand grinding to achieve a really nice finish on this bottom die. And the top die we had to remove from the entire frame, flip upwards so that I could polish that die. That took a long time to move, and it took us a long time taking this thread, um, uh, undoing this thread. Also, when we found out that the uh, top die, or connected to the RAM, uh, was a permanent fixture that the one of the previous owners had decided to do. So, as a power hammer does, it has a die, it usually has a dovetail setup where it sits inside, and then you have a peg or a wedge that's designed to be hammered into the die, and that holds it all in place. In the same situation with this top die. So as you can see, this component is being uh, welded. Now that's the owner's choice on the modification. Uh, my assumption is that they had a wedge coming out on this side of the piece and this entire assembly has been broken off and I think that they've been putting a wedge inside the dovetail, hammering it so much, forcing it in there so that it will uh, hold this top bot die in place but I feel that they put it too much and they've broken the casting of the steel. This is, I think, uh, their, their decision or their hasty decision. They've just basically welded this guy in a permanent fixed position now and I can't really do much about that. So that's really my least favorite part about this hammer, that the, the dies aren't perfect, but um, you'll find those sweet spots, as I said before, you'll find those areas in the power hammer that work really effectively and by God, it works really well when you know where to work on the power hammer dies. Once again, if you like the video, feel free to subscribe, smash that like button with a giant hammer. I'd smash it with this hammer. And if you own a power hammer, if you own a boss hammer, put that down in the comment section below. I'd love to see how many people own this particular hammer still and how many people um, are having them operational it would be really cool to have that down in the comment section. And even if you don't own a boss power hammer, if you own any power hammer that has any different type of action, any um, action at all, pop that down in the comment section below. I'd love to see that. Feel free to chuck a like on the video and uh, subscribe. That would be really awesome. And thank you very much for watching the video all the way through. I'm going to draw a diagram.